Welcome to the very last generation of the Opel Vauxhall Holden Buick Insignia, uh, also known as the Holden Commodore in Australia. It's uh, the very last car that was designed under GM stewardship of Opel Vauxhall before it was sold to Stellantis. In my opinion, it's a real sort of unloved gem of a car because, okay, it's not perfect, but for what you get for the money, both when this car was new and now as a used proposition, I think it is a real bargain. And hopefully by the end of this video, I've talked you into why this car is such a bargain and why it's uh, certainly worth considering. So this car is the last of a line of a very long and strong tradition of uh, Vauxhall Opel cars, stretching back to the original Cavalier. Went from Cavalier through to Vectra, which was a bit of an unloved phase of this car, through to the Insignia, which was a very groundbreaking car in 2008 when it was first released, to this final generation, which is much better than the previous one, but uh, it came out at a time where these cars were just no longer really a sort of car that people wanted, certainly in Europe, where everyone was switching over to crossovers and SUVs. Now at that time, GM, they decided to take the Insignia up market a little bit. It did cost a little bit more than its previous price, but you could tell because this car inside, it's uh, certainly more up market than the previous generation. And in addition to that, they reduced the weight of this car quite significantly by 175 kilos, which is basically like having two uh, adult male passengers removed from the car uh, in terms of weight. So this car is therefore lighter, more nimble, and um, sprightly than the old version. So this version of the Insignia is the Grand Sport version, which means actually just the hatchback or the kind of you know normal shaped car. But there was also the Sports Tourer, which was the estate car version of this, and that obviously had even more room in it, even bigger, more space in the back to fit all your things and your family and your dogs and all that kind of stuff. Like most good modern cars, this car is very easy to drive. You know, everything is taken away from you in terms of effort. The steering's nice and light, the clutch is nice and light. Uh, the throttle isn't too sensitive, it's just easy to drive around town. I would say that the visibility, especially out the back, is not ideal. It is a very big car and you do have quite a small sort of letterbox view out of the back with some big C pillars. But this car does have a reversing camera now that was added afterwards uh, by the owner, but it is an official item and I know that they can be fit, fitted for reasonably cheap and it's something that I would highly recommend. It comes with an electronic handbrake as standard which is actually really easy to use and it means that you know you can put that handbrake on if you want to when you stop but it'll go on when you turn the car off anyway and then when you pull away it will just come off uh, as long as you use the accelerator a tiny bit. It's just really funny because I can see this enormous long bonnet out in front of me. You can see how much space there is around me here and then the back end of the car just feels like it's absolutely miles away. It's, it's a really big car but it means it's a really very spacious car. For example, the boot in this car is a, a decent size. It's actually slightly smaller than the previous generation Insignia, but it's a very usable space and you can fit a lot of stuff in there. Uh, and of course you can fold the seats down and make even more room for stuff if you need to. I'm, I'm a fan of the interior in this car. It's got flair. It's not pretentious. It's not actually quite as high a quality as some of the obvious, obviously more luxury cars like BMW and Audi. But it, it looks great. You've got like this tiered system of, of uh, controls here with the touch screen at the top and then the controls, the physical buttons for that screen underneath it for the radio etc. And then underneath you've got the climate controls and each is like at a different distance from the driver. The whole thing is kind of like driver focused because at the edge of all these controls you've got a kind of separator which tells the passenger not to interfere. It's like this is the driver's domain. The climate controls for the temperature have this little blue and red LED, so red for heat and blue for, for cooling. Many of the controls you need are on the steering wheel, which means that you don't have to uh, take your eye off the road to look for them on the centre console. And it means that you can control things like the heated steering wheel with your thumb here. You can just easily switch that on and off. Yes, I did say heated steering wheel. And it's just it's got this nice chunky feeling to it with uh, grips on it. You've got lots of space for bottles and things. So you've got two cup holders at the front, another third one in the centre console and then two big door pockets. Now the glove box is quite small, um, I think some of it must be used by a fuse box. There's no sunglasses holder up here and there's no like extra little one on the side or anything. So I like the dials in front of me, 
they are old school and that screen is admittedly very old hat looking it's like something from 15 years ago of course it was available as a digital dashboard as well which was a bit nicer but it's quite sophisticated it's got this liberal use of white and red and the white and red comes across as, as a quite business-like almost like an Audi uh, maybe there's some inspiration there and of course they're just very simple you've got your fuel and your temperature which are actual dials that tell you exactly what temperature and how much fuel you've got now this car it's the VX line trim which is somewhere in the middle it, you've got these very adjustable seats that do lumbar support and they're quite comfortable in, in the past I've complained about Vauxhall seats the leather seats because they're very firm but these fabric seats are uh, not so bad but this car was essentially available with all of the very best technology that you could get in 2017 including all of the obvious modern safety technology like stuff that, that warns you of collisions and keeps you in lane and, and it was available with heated seats both in the front but also the back uh, which is a, a huge luxury item now this car this doesn't have heated seats it does have the heated steering wheel which is an absolutely brilliant thing in my opinion and very underrepresented in a lot of modern cars instead of having to put the key in you've got a start stop button in this car now it's one of those where you have to use the key to unlock the car by pressing the button in the old style way but then you use a button to actually start the car so it's not keyless entry but it is keyless go this car's got automatic rain sensing wipers and automatic headlights and like the Astra that I had you can't turn the headlights off at night It'll, it auto is the minimum setting for it so it decides if the lights are on and if the lights are on it's like the lights are on you're not allowed to decide now this infotainment screen here it's no, by no means an advanced system but it is very good for what it is it's very responsive when you click on anything it just responds very fast it's not like they've overdone it with all the graphics and things in order to make it look cool but then it's like dead laggy and you have to wait ages for it to actually do anything it's it's very fast and very usable it's got basic options like your your radio and the settings for the car and of course there's millions of settings that you can set this car is quite customizable in that regard and then you've got this uh, quite basic navigation system but the, the joy of it is is of course that you can have Android Auto or Apple CarPlay and it now means that you've got a built-in iPhone or Android phone in your screen in your car and it, and it means you can use Google Maps it means you can use Spotify and all your music and, and it's like that was available on all these insignias so that is an absolutely fantastic thing that you know not all cars had at that time the climate controls are somewhere between a brand new car where everything's done through the screen and old school way of doing it with buttons. You've got sort of the common features that you might want, but some of the features are exclusively in the screen, like if you want the air to be firing at you or down at your feet or whatever on the screen, that's done through this screen. But there is a physical climate button at the bottom which switches the screen on to climate control mode, so it's quite easy to get to it quickly if you do need uh, to make any adjustments. Unlike many other brands, the Insignia wasn't available with that many different engines. For a start, there were no hybrid options, none of these fancy uh, electric and petrol hybrids. It was all just your old school petrol and diesel, and there weren't that many choices. So you started off with like a 1.5 litre petrol turbo, which actually is quite a good performer because of course it's a turbo and it's got enough power to shift this, this big car. Then there were a couple of uh, two litre diesel options. Uh, this is the higher powered one at 170 horsepower and uh, this car itself has actually been remapped to over 200 which is a very simple thing you can do if you need the power at the top end you had the 260 brake horsepower 2 litre petrol which came in the GSI trim and or the Elite trim and so on like some of the higher spec models so that's a lot of power for a front wheel drive hatchback and of course I would say that the 170 horsepower diesel is really well suited to this car it's got lots of performance and obviously this car with its 200 plus it's uh, it really goes quite quickly when you put your foot down. Uh, it's in that sort of typical diesel way, which is to sort of give you all the power at once and throw you back in your seat and then, oh, there it is. And then you, you know, change gear and then there it is again. And then you change gear and then there it is again in fifth gear. Not to 60, you'll be uh, dispatched in, in less than eight seconds and probably like more like six or seven in this car. And then when it comes to MPG, it's not gonna, set the world on fire in terms of its uh, miles per gallon for a diesel car for a modern diesel car it's not hugely impressive on a long journey down from scotland it's average kind of like high 40s almost 50 mpg which you know in, in in some of the rivals you could get you could easily get 55 on a run when you get into the twisty corners you can definitely tell that this car is not quite as heavy as it once was it's been on a diet that helps with the um, the sort of nimble feeling of this car although it is still a very big car it is actually quite a competent car in the corners. Obviously not going to set the world alight. It was a front-wheel drive only, 
and it was definitely set up for a sort of comfortable cruising ability because obviously the, the, the ride quality is good and so on. But you know, with these big grippy tyres on it, throwing it down your favourite A road or whatever, and for your average driver it's absolutely fine in terms of uh, its handling ability, and I include myself in that average driver category, you know. All cars came with a six-speed manual or a six or eight-speed automatic. Now this car is the six-speed manual. It's got the very best way of engaging reverse gear, which with, is with a little trigger, uh, like you've got a gun in your hand to select reverse, and I really like that. It's a, a perfectly usable gearbox. It's not the slickest in the world. But it's just a very relaxing car to drive. When you're going at higher speeds, like 50 miles an hour, 60 or 70, it's just set up for that kind of cruising ability. Because it's such a long car, it's got a big long wheelbase. It's got lots of space in the cabin. The only thing I would say is that you do get quite a lot of tire noise. Maybe perhaps there's not as much uh, sound deadening in this car as there should be. So it's that time of the video where we're going to find out what it's like in the back of this Vauxhall Insignia. And for that, I've got my old good friend Backseat JJ. And I think I get the feeling that he's really going to like the back of this car. What do you think, mate? Yes, mate. How did you know? It's uh, really, really good back here. It's very spacious. I've got an unbelievably huge amount of leg room. I mean, you're, we're both six foot tall and, and we've still got space. For, you know, you could get any size adults with any leg length. The, there is headroom. There is plenty of headroom for me, but... If you were a bit taller, you might start to, to struggle for that. But overall, it's just very spacious. I mean, you've got all the usual stuff like door pockets, which are quite small, seat pockets, which are quite small. You've got ventilation and you've got USB-A, so I can charge my phone and play Candy Crush while we're driving along. I've got this nice big armrest in the center here, which you'd want to be using that because if you were sat in the middle, I think you would struggle for space. There's no actual like seat cushion space for your bum. And there's a big transmission tunnel slash exhaust tunnel or whatever it is because this car's front wheel drive behind you you've got these adjustable headrests which means that let's see here i can set this up for me and uh, it's going to protect me from whiplash in, in an accident or whatever and i feel like i could be chauffeured around in this car and uh, jj can do my bidding and take me wherever i like so back to you mate oh yeah cheers man thank you So the owner Callum's very kindly brought this to the Peak District all the way from Scotland and he's not shy of doing a few miles in this car to the point where he's done around, around 50,000 miles in a year in it. Now this car's now on 99,000 miles and he got it on 39,000 or so and he's done all those miles in almost no time at all. So in those 60,000 miles I can hear you ask what went wrong with this car and uh, it's actually a very short list. It was the AdBlue control unit which is obviously the control unit for that stuff that you have to add to the AdBlue tank for this diesel car in order to reduce the emissions uh, coming out of the exhaust pipe. And that control unit uh, broke and it had to be replaced. Now, Callum had the extended warranty, so that was all okay. Uh, and the second thing was a knock sensor, which needed replacing as well. Given that he's done 60,000 miles in this car, that is very impressive. And I think that the, it is a pretty well-made and robust car. In many ways, this car is an old dinosaur of a car. It's, it's a car from the past. It's a big, long saloon car slash hatchback thing. It's a car that wasn't available with any hybrid system. It was a, it was a car that is of an era that has basically died out. I, don't, I just think it now it's a real shame that, that you know Stellantis owned this company, and it's not because Stellantis build bad cars, because they don't, they build good cars, but it's just a little bit less competition. It's a little bit more of an amalgamation of all these companies, and who'd have thought that I'd be saying that about GM, which is one of the original companies that owned everything, you know, but you know, we, we're not going to see quite as much variety like all of the cars like the Corsa and the future insignias, whatever they may be, will be based on Peugeot Citroen underpinnings. All that considered, do you want one of these? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's still got that Vauxhall badge. It's still, you know, not seen as a particularly fancy or luxurious car. It's not a car that you would be able to show off about if you bought it. But you would know. If, if you're someone who's just happy to know that you've got something good and you can enjoy the car and use it every day and, and uh, enjoy all of its spaciousness and its practicality and its uh, comfortable long distance ability, and you don't care that you know your neighbour's got an Audi and, you, and your other mate's got a BMW and a Volvo, you can rest easy knowing you made the sensible choice. And not only that, but you've got a more unusual car to go with it as well. You just don't see these around as much. If you've enjoyed this video, please do remember to hit the like button. If you've got a Vauxhall Opel Holden Insignia, please do comment below and tell me what you think of the car. Um, anything that you don't like about it, do like about it. Has it been reliable, etc. Please let me know. And a really big thank you to Callum and Robin for coming all the way down from Scotland to bring this car to the channel. So thank you guys. 
if you want to see a video on um, another another car then it'll be up there and uh, just thank you very much for watching and uh, i'll see you in the next video